Thanks for the great introduction. Yesterday we are talking about, <coughs> we're looking at political communication on Twitter and looking how the responses change in terms of hate speech across parties, gender and ethnicity. Also, I might be coughing, so sorry about that. Let's start with social media. Recently, there has been a spike in use of social media by politicians. For example, in 2009, around 70 uh, Congress people were using Twitter and currently everyone uses it both for professional use and some even for personal one. And there are good reasons for that. First, we have a unidirectional communication with constituents, meaning we are not restricted by time, place, and at any moment we could share our message and make it available to other people. Second is a dialogue with constituents. And this is what we are focusing here on. So here people can get direct input on their propositions, on any news, and so on and so forth. Last but not least, there's also political mobilization. So if we want to rally somebody for crowdfunding for some project, we can use it also with social media, though it does not, of course, guarantee success. However, this transition to social media is not always a positive thing. For example, social media is known to <coughs> foster echo chambers and us versus them rhetoric, which correlates with harassment and hate speech. And the latter can be defined as abusive or threatening speech against a particular group, often on the basis of ethnicity and sexual orientation. This also, it is also present in discussions that have strong emotional response, such as politics. And it can cause many detrimental effects, such as further polarization, which is already present in political discussion, erosion of intergroup political relationships, and can also be grounds for spread of misinformation. With that, we have three main research questions. First, are the members of the US Congress more likely to receive hate speech and the replies, depending on party affiliation, gender, and ethnicity? And second is, that hate speech and the replies depend on the sentiment of the source tweet? And if yes, does the strength of the differ on party, gender, and ethnicity? All of the points we have here have been shown to, all persons from these groups have been shown to act differently. So for example, Democrats project higher sentiment and Republicans project negative sentiment with stronger group identity. But what is more important for our research, they have been shown that people react differently depending on those factors. For example, there is a pretty strong connotations of gender stereotypes online. Meaning that, for example, if somebody is listening to a woman and she has a strong position or forceful position, she might be counted as less persuasive or even outright rejected and her message ignored. And of course, they are also targets for harassment and hate speech online. With ethnicity, an example is, for example, African-Americans in the United States are also often target of hate speech and harassment. So to answer our questions, first we need a data set. And here we're looking at all 541 members of the latest 117th US Congress. On the right-hand side, you can see a Venn diagram that illustrates the distribution of people within it. This is the latest Congress that convened on January 21. And to the, to the date, it is the most, the most diverse one. For example, more than almost 40% of Democrats subscribe themselves to a person of color and almost 9% of Republicans. So for each member, we went to the site of Congress and looked at their personal and political pages to gather the following information. Political party, chamber of Congress in which they serve, how long have, have they served there, their gender and their ethnicity. For, the, <coughs> for each of them, we leveraged Twitter historical API to get the entire tweet history or timelines. We were, we were not interested in their replies or their retweets, only the original messages, which is in the end we have almost 200,000. Then for each of the original messages, we gathered up to 250 replies. So this leaves us with 8.3 million of the corresponding replies. To check for the sentiment, we also had to calculate sentiment strength for each original message. For that, we used sentiment strength, and it means our sentiment varies from minus four, which means absolutely negative and nothing positive about it, to plus four. And this means absolutely positive, not a single point of negative thought within the message. Lastly, we need to detect hate speech in all of the replies to look at them. <coughs> For that, we used an annotated Twitter set from David Natal. It contains 25,000 tweets that were labeled actually in three categories, regular speech, offensive speech, and hate speech. Offensive speech might contain words that are correlated with hate speech or might be used. So 
but not in this context. Here, three, at least three people were asked to label it and think about the context and not only about the words. Then we used it to train <coughs> deep neural network with, <coughs> sorry, that uses universal sentence encoder and output variable is binary, either hate speech or not. Of course, we then additionally validated our results by running our regressions one more time with hate based dictionary approach and found confirmatory results. Finally, important thing to understand is we are looking at tweet levels, not at the reply levels, which means we calculate share of hateful replies for each source tweets. So our dependent variable varies from zero, so no replies were hateful, to one every reply was indeed hate speech. Let's look at the summary statistics. Just looking at our distributions, we can see the following. Democrats receive more hate speech than Republicans. Women in our data set have more hate speech than men, and people of color, persons of color, have more hate speech than white people. And this is statistically significant according to Z-test. To check it from a different perspective, we also plot, as you can see on the right-hand side, complementary cumulative distributions for those three groups. And once again, we see confirmatory results. The interesting part is that in summary statistics, the highest discrepancy is with persons of color. I think they receive something like 40% more hate speech in our data set. But once we're done with summary statistics, we can look at proper regression analysis, which allows to check the effect size after controlling for confounding effects. Here, two important points. First, it is a multi-level binomial model, and it is also a mixed effects model, meaning we do control <coughs> for user-specific random effects, so they can have heterogeneity in social influence or in their reach. And we do two main analysis. First, without interaction terms, and second, with them. Instantly, from the analysis, we can see the highest discrepancy is once again with persons of color. I think, yeah, the odds of receiving hate speech for persons of color is 1.41 times that of white politicians. Second, we also have Results that women receive more hate speech in replies than men. And here, without interaction effects, <coughs> this can also be true for Republicans. Lastly, so sentiment is indeed connected to the amount of hate speech. The more negative original message is, the less the sentiment, the more hate speech we receive. However, this does depend on the party and other factors. From our interaction terms, Parts and ethnicity and parts and source sentiment are relevant. Here, the way they affect it implies two things. First, persons of color from the Democratic Party receive more hate speech, or more likely to receive hate speech than persons of color from the Republican Party. And second, which I personally find very important, is if tweet, a negative tweet is after, authored by Democrats, they also receive more hate speech, even though the sentiment of the tweet might be the same between Democrats. And Republicans, Democrats would be received more harshly. So <coughs> this moves us to our implications and what we would like to do next. Implications is, yes, unfortunately, there is indeed a difference in how people treat and react to your messages depending on who you are, on your party, on your gender, or on your ethnicity, which of course means that in that case, social media is not always positive and is so-called double-edged sword for the politicians. On one hand, yes, you may reach wider audience, you might rally people, but you might also receive copious amounts of hate speech, which might not necessarily be because of something you said, but just because of who you are, which is also relevant from societal perspective because targeted hate speech might change the um, participation of people in politics, for example, for um, less protected groups or groups that are treated more harshly, they might not want, they might want no longer to participate in politics, which would have a detrimental effect on democracy and composition of our parliament, congress, and other important parts of society. So for the future research, we would be interested in two main things. First, we would like to compare the findings with other countries and other social media platforms. And second, we are interested <coughs> in a more in-depth analysis of the authors of the replies, in particular, to see what if there's a difference in their social networks, where they participate to which views they attribute, and in connection with that also bot and troll replies, which we think might slightly affect our results. So thank you very much.
I would be extremely happy to discuss it further and answer any questions you might have.